Ladies and gentlemen, kicking off the first stop on his world tour, our new president and prophet, Russell M. Nelson! You say you want some revelation, well here you go. It's gonna blow your freaking mind. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the weekly Mormon News Roundup. I am your humble host, Steve Ace, which is talent on loan from Kola. My crew and I ruminate weekly on the great and spacious beehive, so thanks so much for joining us to discuss the current events in Mormondom. This is December 3rd, 2023. This is episode 91. There are some insane Mormon sexual abuse lawsuit allegations you're not going to want to miss. Tim Ballard and Sean Reyes, they're getting sued yet again, and we're going to give you all the details. There's some new guidance from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints about stake organizations, and it's very interesting stuff. And finally, we're going to give you a day in the life of Susan's husband, part two. Now, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm at www.mormonnewsroundup.org, or you can send me an email to kolob at mormonnewsroundup.org. I'd like to invite onto the program my fabulous co-hosts, Lila Tuller and Rebecca. How's it going, guys? Doing great. How are and you? Rebecca, how's it going? fabulous we're all dressed up so festively this is awesome i love december yes it's a fabulous time of the year and uh, lila we've had rebecca on many many times she's a permanent uh, co-host here on the mormon news roundup and lila what's your one minute story what are you all about okay well super fast um i'm just a a mother of seven kids um was in the church for you know my whole life raised born and raised um had a a high profile father who was a 70 back in the, um, you know, six, mid sixties to the late eighties. Um, I left the church when I was 57 after, um, deconstructing over a short period of time it was really, well, you know how it is with deconstruction. It's kind of like little teeny bits at a time. And then all at once, and that's the way it was for me. And since then, you know, I'm, I'm a hardworking single mom. Well, thanks so much for coming on the program. We greatly appreciate that. We're going to kick this right off the start here with a new lawsuit that has been filed against Sean Reyes and Tim Ballard. And they're accusing that in this lawsuit, they're accusing the attorney general of the state of Utah of intimidating critics of Tim Ballard and OUR. And this is a fascinating look here into the what I call the Mormon power industrial complex here. This is some insane allegations. Let me walk you through a few of them, get you guys as a reaction. Number one, um, it states that The Sound of Freedom had a sequel in the works that was called Cry of Freedom, and it was partially written by Reyes. And here they are in a podcast mansplaining. I wouldn't know anything about that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that, and that allegation two, the plaintiff here is Suzanne Whitehead, and this says the cause of action arises out of defendant Utah General Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes' unconstitutional suppression of right of free speech. And this is there's an allegation, there's more factual allegations here, which shows screenshots and quotes from Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes, who's rapping, "Get too close, my words will send you, mess with me, and I'll revenge you." Yo, uh, Lila, what are your initial thoughts here about this allegation from the article that you read? Did he actually do that rap? Did he yeah. Make those words? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, that says it all, doesn't it? So don't yeah. mess with Sean Reyes or clearly his best friend, Tim Ballard. You know, and Rebecca, it looks like, you know, there's a photo here of Sean Reyes hugging Tim Ballard. You know, that would be very good in, if they were cellmates in the future. Don't you think it'll, that relationship would be um, very uh, cozy? Yeah, they may be cellmates in the future. We don't know. Yeah, I hadn't seen that picture. That is very cozy. It's something you might send out on a on a, a Hallmark greeting card at Christmas time. They might want to think about that. So a lawsuit says that the Attorney General Sean Reyes apparently believes that Tim Ballard was appointed as the Mormon chosen one yeah. and has treated Ballard as being above the jurisdiction of the government and church authorities. And don't forget that Sean Reyes, he was a former bishop of the LDS Church. The allegation in the lawsuit says that uh, Sean Reyes provided cover for the uh, disgraced uh, uh, OUR organization. Be you helped launch us because we had no credibility, Tim Ballard said to Attorney General Sean Reyes, and allegedly Sean Reyes was profiting from this entire endeavor as well. It says that Utah, Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes helped Ballard become a character of mythological proportions with unquestioned legitimacy. And uh, it was very self-aggrandizing. And I mean, this is just in a crazy allegation here that, uh, that, you know, they're covering up all of the improprieties that happened with Tim Ballard of being a grifter, of, 
you know, not rescuing children. And this was all being shrouded by not only the state attorney general, but Mormon leadership was all in a cozy. They were all bosom friends here to keep Tim Ballard and prop him up until it fell apart like a house of cards. A good friend of mine is an attorney himself and read over the lawsuit. And he did not think it was uh, a good lawsuit. He thought it wasn't strong enough. So hopefully, um, if they're really going to do this, they come up with some uh, more strong allegations that have some actual backing to them because he felt like this would be thrown out. So that's the first thing I have to say about it. But if it's true, you know, obviously, I am not a fan of Tim Ballard um, based on a lot of information I've heard. So I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of it's true. Yeah, and Rebecca, look look at this picture, Rebecca. The lawsuit states that Utah State Attorney General Sean Reyes helped Tim Ballard gain access to the upper leadership of the LDS Church, mm -hmm. and General Reyes allowed Tim Ballard to publish a photo of the two of them publicly praying for a supposed, op you know, they're supposedly rescuing children here, and here they are praying for God to help them rescue the children, and the allegation is that they didn't rescue any children at all, and that Sean Reyes is the one who helped Tim Ballard get to the top of the Mormon power structure. What do you think? Well, number one, I never realized that Tim Ballard was so short. I mean, that, you know, Sean Reyes <laughs> is not exactly really tall. That's a very interesting picture. <laughs> but no, and I agree with what Lila said. It seems like the lawsuit uh, doesn't really have any legs. But uh, the things that are coming out, um, what people are saying about it, that's the interesting part, right? That is exactly what it is. And, and of course, he helped him up to the top of Mormon leadership. It seems like everybody, based on these blessings that Tim was getting from Tom Harrison, Elder Ballard, Everybody believes he's operating beyond the law, above even church authority. And, and he really is this idea. There's this idea baked into Mormonism. Call it one mighty and strong. Call it Davidic servant. There is this special person with special powers that's supposed to arrive and take us all to heaven with him. And everyone seems to think this is Tim. Everyone. Well, some people think it might be Kanye West, because if you look in the uh, lawsuit here, it says that uh, Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes discussed issues with people on a leather chair that Kanye West allegedly purchased for him at his unofficial office. You know, it's just the amount of people that are getting involved with this it also says that uh, Tim Ballard uh, gave access to Glenn Beck. Sean Reyes was behind the scenes here making it so that Tim Ballard would have access to all of these powerful figures and then shielding him from his alleged criminal and uh, civil uh, lawsuits. He was, you know, he was the one who was uh, uh, an integral part of propping up this entire scheme for years and making sure that uh, people were silenced, that people were intimidated and that nothing would come to light. And, um, you know, it also goes to the top of the Mormon power structure as well. It's all part of a big Mormon industrial military complex in utah of once you get into these powerful positions where there's lots of money people will help you grift people will help you uh perpetuate your shams and um, what's your last thoughts on this one lila it's disgusting i mean it just infuriates me to think about um my dad was actually a victim of a, of a horrible mormon scam and this is just the same thing only this goes to the top this goes up to the the first presidency um and the president of the uh the quorum of the 12 and if all of those allegations you know that we've heard about uh melvin j ballard or no <laughs> what's his name is it melvin yeah. j there's too many ballards too many melvins too many russells yeah, elder yeah. ballard recently deceased elder elder ballard. Ballard. Thank let's you. say that <laughs> yeah um that he was involved and i mean this is just ugly it's ugly it looks bad for the church real bad and and you know so many of the people in the church right now who are actually actually active members have no idea yeah. what's going on that's yeah. the part that's scary to me it's like they don't even realize it yeah and rebecca that's the thing you know tim ballard wouldn't have got as far as he did as far as getting into the mormon power structure that's what this says he wouldn't have been able to get into the mormon power structure without sean reyes connecting mm -hmm. him to glenn beck connecting him to the, the top of the LDS church with and shielding him from the criminal liabilities without Sean Reyes, this entire thing would have fallen apart. And again, don't forget that Sean Reyes, he was intimately involved with the sound of freedom with the sequels. He was profiting from, o, he was allegedly profiting from OUR. You know, it's just one big cozy Mormon power scheme right at the top where millions flow into these, uh, into the pockets of these folks. No, I agree. And I, I hope that it sheds a light on that 
hand in glove relationship between politics and church in Utah. We do live in a theocracy and this happens all the time. And I think this is just a very overt example of it. And I hope people pay attention. Honestly, I hope they understand what's really happening in their state. Yeah, uh, our next article here is a doozy here, and this is a really reaching the mainstream news as far as women who are suing the Mormon church over a doctor who had years of abuse. This is the most egregious case of sexual assault that I've come across where a doctor, Dr. Farley, was accused of sexually assaulting over 200 mostly Mormon women as part of his uh, medical practice, and now they are suing him. Let me cue this up for you. Get your reaction to what's going on here. Hundreds of women in the church are coming forward, accusing a member, a Harvard-educated physician named Dr. David Farley, of sexually abusing all of them. And more importantly, they are accusing the church of a rampant and widespread cover-up, saying they each had the same experience, and when they reported it, they also had the same experience, the church doing nothing. Joining me now, three of those women, Nicole Snow, Lisa Pratt and Katie Medley. Nicole, uh, what was the experience of when you would speak out about this and how the church knew about these concerns? Yeah, when I originally reported it to the church, um, they were already aware of the situation. And the response I got was uh, they first told me the repentance process at which they are going to step and walk Farley through. And then they told me that, uh, you know, potentially the church lawyers are going to get in contact with me. Um, to this day, they have not uh, taken away his membership or punished him whatsoever. Lisa, you got the wide eyes uh, when uh, Nicole was talking about uh, the, the, the lawyers getting in touch and that they'll take care of it. What was your experience and what do you think people need to know about why you're so sure that the larger organization was aware and chose to cover it up? Um, because from the beginning, when I first called the leader of the church and let him know what was going on and how I had been abused and so many others I had spoken to had at the hands of this one of their members, um, we were told that you know, they're gonna to talk to Salt Lake, speak to the church's attorneys, um, get it all figured out. Um, and, you know, it's been three years now and we just keep being told that, oh, it'll happen and nothing has happened. And I know that it has come from the top. They spoke to the church's legal counsel for that. And Salt Lake, that's who handles all these situations. And they know, they know, they've seen our lawsuit. They know that there are 130 women and according to district attorneys, over 200 filed police reports, they have seen all of that. Yet he is still free and allowed to participate in the church wherever it is that he lives. And we know that right now, well, we're pretty sure that he's in Utah, he's bounced around. And there's just all these very trusting people who now have the opportunity to be Hurt my head. I feel I feel like this is a repeat of the same type of story I've heard over and over and over. Um, this happened recently here in Utah Valley. Uh, a fame, uh, you know, a doctor, a gynecologist, did the same thing. It's like, when is this going to stop? And why is the church doing nothing? Why are the women told to you know forgive their perpetrators, and the perpetrators are not punished, and they go on to continue to to perpetrate, you know, they can, they go on to harm other people. I don't get it. Yeah. And that's the thing, Rebecca here is that he's still, he hasn't even been excommunicated. I mean, how many reports to over 230 women, 200 reports at some point in time, do we need to have a membership council? I mean, look, when is that going to take place? Well, he is innocent until proven guilty. Isn't that the tack they take with certain people? Other people, they're thrown right under the bus and kicked out right away, you know, with very little evidence. So I think one of the keys to what one, one of the women said was trusting, right? He is literally like a wolf in a pen of sheep. They're especially very vulnerable women. I, I'm imagining it's a scenario where you're going in like maybe for your premarital exam right before you get married. 
a lot of people have limited sex education. They don't know anything and, and very easy to take advantage of that. You do not know what's appropriate in an exam like that. You know, chances are your parents don't talk to you about it. You don't really know. It's just, it's just literally like a, like I said, like a wolf in a sheep's pen. And it, it makes me think of, um, I talked to you in one interview I was doing, Dr. Daryl Ray, and he wrote the book, Sex and God, How Religion Ruins Sexuality. And he said that when you are so repressed and have no knowledge and your sexuality is just distorted um, by a high demand, high control religion um, from a very young age, there's going to be acting out in some way or another. And so I think you see so many cases like this because everyone has just been manipulated from the beginning and, and whatever is happening is just unconscionable for these poor women. So it's, it's a perfect storm trust. And then these really bad behaviors It's just, and we'll see it again. I'm sure, I'm sure this is not the last story by far. No, we unfortunately won't be. And this is a very uh, ironic Twitter reaction that I saw this week that uh, referenced this particular uh, uh, this particular lawsuit. And it says that women leaders who are sitting on the stand and sacrament meeting, well, something must be done. But women reporting sexual abuse, well, we might get back to you if we feel like it. Yep. That's the irony right there. That's a level of priority that um, is really, really amazing. Yeah, I mean, sure, people should, we live in the United States of America. People are innocent until proven guilty, but you can still hold the membership council at any point in time along the way and look at the evidence, okay? Bring these women in and uh, find out what, get to the bottom of the truth. And we don't need people participating in the church who are credibly accused sexual offenders who have 130, 200 women that are saying that they have been sexually abused. Those are those are not the type of people that we need to have in the church, and they need to be rooted out. Now they will root out uh, podcasters who have who who say not quite the right thing. They they slight criticism of church leadership, so they're quick to root those people out. But if you repeatedly and persistently for years sexually abuse women, well, no, we don't even have a membership council for you. You can continue to perpetrate. I think of uh, Tim Ballard. I mean, they excommunicated him within days, you know, and of course, I'm obviously not defending him at all, but he was also accused. He's in the middle of a lawsuit. Nothing has happened yet, right? So his connection, of course, was to the brethren. If there were some connection with any of these doctors that are being accused to upper church leadership, I guarantee they would be excommunicated and distanced right away. Right. So if you are connected to the right people, then the church will take action. But if you, if, if these women are not, don't have, the connections that Lila has or the connections that some people has to church leadership, then they won't be able to be taken seriously. It'll fall on deaf ears. But if yeah. you do have connections to the top, just like we saw earlier with uh, Sean Reyes and Tim Ballard, if you have connections, it's amazing how long you can go on perpetrating um, disgusting activities and nothing happens. But if you're just a regular Joe member like myself, well, there's a different set of standards for those folks. Kevin Frankie, he has filed for divorce, a domestic relations injunction against his wife, Ruby, amid child abuse allegations. Ruby Frankie has already been um, arrested. And, she, you know, Kevin Frankie, he's the husband of the eight passengers YouTube vlogger, Ruby Frankie. He's filing for divorce and domestic relations injunction, outlining stringent measures to govern the conduct of both parties involved. This is a rather detailed uh, this is a rather detailed court pleading here for the daughter. And this is the daughter of accused child abuser. Ruby Frankie says that life is upside down since mom has been arrested. And there's a bunch of injunctions here, again, including prohibitions against harassment, domestic violence, mis misuse of personal information. You're not allowed to speak evil of either of the parents. Uh, you can't move any assets around. I find this to be very remarkable because it seemed like after that Ruby was arrested, it seemed like her husband didn't exactly take her side on it, but he definitely, um, he was kind of hedging his bets and now the whole house of parts is falling apart. Well, what are your thoughts on this one, Rebecca? Um, yeah, he's an interesting character, I think, because I think I remember, was he the one that uh, tried to sue his elder daughter and tried to um, stop them from getting into the house to take clothes out? Anyway, he's, he's been hard to pin down. And I think you're right, maybe hedging bets is part of it. But now it looks like divorce. And as I understand it, um, that agreement that you just went over right there, that's pretty standard, especially in a high profile situation like this, where everyone just kind of retreat to your corner and we'll, we'll battle this out in the courts. So let's not do anything else uh, aside from that. 
Yeah, and Lila, the court has placed particular emphasis on the welfare of the minor children who are involved, who allegedly Ruby was neglecting these children for years. She wasn't feeding them properly. She was um, engaging in psychological abuse to the children and neglect. The whole reason that this whole thing fell apart is that the children went to a neighbor and said that they were hungry. They looked like they hadn't been fed in a, in a long period of time. That's the whole reason that it came out. Now, yeah. this, this injunction, it restricts both parties from making any derogatory remarks about each other in the presence of their children and from influencing the children views regarding custody or parental time it seems like we are seeing more and more of these types of articles of these high profile social media influenced people especially latter-day saints who all of a sudden what you see on the exterior it's not what you get on the inside that is so true it's such a uh smoke and mirrors game they play uh and the fact that she was involved with um what's her name hildebrandt what was her first name? Jody, Jody. Hildebrand. Uh, and, you know, the two of them together cooked up this great idea of how to teach your kids how not to masturbate and things like that. And it involved um, tying them up in the basement and, and withholding food from them. And they, you know, this little boy that got loose and went to the neighbors um, was emaciated. He had He had marks around his arms and feet where he had been tied up. Somehow he got away. And that's the only way this has come to light. If left to their devices, uh, Frankie and Hildebrandt, I wonder if those kids would survive at all. I, it's just horrific. You know, here they have all this social media presence. We have, they have all this, these accolades and, and they're members of the church and they're very high profile. But behind the scenes, it's like everything else in the church right now. It seems there is a lot of... Uh, nasty, dirty, underlying uh, things going on that the general public doesn't know until it finally comes out like in something like this. Is she not in prison? I thought yeah, she's a, she's currently she's arrested. She's currently incarcerated because of the nature of the charges that she did not make post bail because of the nature of the charges. So, yes, she's in prison. So the husband has taken charge of the children and is now filed for divorce. Great. And we hope that this uh, Rebecca, what I really hope to see with this particular case is that, uh, you know, that this eight passengers case is leading Utah lawmakers to argue for better overseeing of what is called so-called life coaches. Because that's what it was entirely built on, Rebecca, is these li you know, supposed life coaches. And uh, I want to play this clip for you. And uh, let's hope that this uh, particular bill um, in Utah passes that can help maybe clamp down on these uh, quack on the quackery that we've seen with Jody Hildebrand and Ruby Frankie. New at 6 tonight, one Utah lawmaker believes more needs to be done to oversee life coaches all across the state of Utah. It comes as the child abuse case against Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrand continues in court. It is our top story tonight on 2 News at 6. I'm Heidi Hatch. And I'm Brian Schnee. State Senator David Hinkins says Ruby Frankie's own husband asked him to heighten restrictions on these coaches. The state senator says people all over the country are giving out bad advice to their clients. And he questions if many of these coaches are qualified to advise anyone at all. Paul Nelson is joining us live tonight from the state capitol. And Paul, what started all of this? Well, according to Senator David Hinkins, it was Ruby Frankie's estranged husband, Kevin, who asked him to look into the qualification that it takes to become a life coach in Utah. As it turns out, there are no qualifications, and he believes that bad advice from unqualified coaches have been ruining families for a long time. If you look on the Connections Classroom website, you'll see accused child abuser Ruby Frankie described as a, quote, certified mental fitness trainer. It's just a title that somebody can make up and makes it sound professional when it's really probably not. There are some companies that sell online courses for what they call mental health fitness training, but District 26 Senator David Hinkins says Frankie was allowed to use that title whether she took the courses or not. I don't think there's anything that stops her from saying that. And I don't know that she's had any background training to be that. Former clients have been coming forward since Frankie and Connections founder Jody Hildebrand were arrested on allegations of child abuse. One former client, Trey Warner, told KUTV back in September that Connections would use shaming tactics to pit family members against each other. It started to feel more and more evil. And I finally, in one of the group meetings, I got up and I just said, 
This is off. Officials from the Utah Division of Professional Licensing sent a text saying, quote, we do see some complaints that are against life coaches who are former licensed behavioral health practitioners who lost the license and are now practicing as life coaches. The text also said, quote, life coaches are not required to be licensed in Utah. Therefore, there are no standards for the industry, end quote. I think that those that are professed to be life coaches should have some type of a criteria that they need to uh, some credibility. Now, according to Doppel officials, some of these life coaches are actually very good at their job. However, there is a shortage of licensed mental health practitioners in Utah, which might be one of the reasons why so many people are turning to life coaches in the first place. Okay, Rebecca, do we need better overseeing of life coaches in Utah as a result of what we've seen from the eight passengers case? Oh, absolutely. 100%. Anybody and their dog, literally their dog can become a life coach. And I know it's not that way in other states. I know there are more rigorous standards and there are certifications and all that. But again, a lot of people don't understand the mental health industry. They don't understand the different certifications, the licenses. They probably think if they see somebody set up in a nice office, oh, they must be somebody with a credential. Where in reality, they're just somebody that said, I like to tell people what to do. <laughs> I'm being facetious, of course, because I, you know, I know there are some life coaches that, that, you know, can do a lot of good, but I also wonder if this new law were to be passed. I know a lot of people that use their ecclesiastical leaders as a life coach. For example, your bishop. I just the other day had a friend that said, oh, I think I might want to go back to school. I'm going to go ask my bishop. Really? <laughs> so will there be some kind of oversight for bishops? And in this case, it's not only a life coach. It's somebody that you think is speaking with complete authority over you and your life. So you're going to take that advice very seriously, no matter what your bishop says. So if there is um, if there is some kind of oversight and certification, I would think that ecclesiastical leaders would fall into that too. Well, I don't want Sean Reyes to be my life coach. I'm just going <laughs> to put that out there right now. Or, or Tim <laughs> Ballard for that matter. <laughs> yeah. We got a lot of legal machinations this week. I mean, we got a lot of legal stuff this week. This entire first section has all been legal stuff. And in the news also here is Lori Vallow, the convicted, uh, felony convicted for murder, uh, has been booked on murder charge in fatal shooting. And she was extradited to Arizona on Thursday. Now, why is she being extradited? What's going on here? Let's watch this one. And uh, Lila, get your reaction here. Just after midnight last night, Maricopa County Sheriff's Office deputies booked Lori Vallow into our ITR facility. One count of first degree murder, one count of premeditated first degree murder. She was extradited from Pocatello, Idaho, where she was already in, the, in their Department of Corrections there in custody at one of the prisons. We sent four deputies there by car. Normally we would fly, our extradition team would fly to pick it up, but because of weather conditions, we felt that it was um, more predictable and more within our control that if we were going to transport her, that we wouldn't have to deal with any kind of um, weather conditions or air travel challenges. So our deputies left on uh, on the 27th for Idaho, arrived there, stayed for a day to prepare and brought her back. We sent two extraditions deputies, uh, a supervisor, and one deputy from our K-9 division, but it's just because she's a female deputy. We want to make sure there was a female accompanying um, suspect Vallo in her tra in her travel back. It was about an 18-hour trip. Uh, in my statement, as you saw, I talked about the fact that we do about 250 plus extraditions every year. So this is not new for them. The, uh, the uniqueness or maybe the circumstances involved in this particular case are very high profile and, and much to the interest of our local and national audience. Um, I don't want to diminish it. It is what we do, as I stated, and we do it very well, whether it is her or any other fugitive who's wanted in the state of Arizona. We're going to facilitate transfer into our custody so the prosecutor's office can prosecute them effectively. Uh, she had her initial appearance at about 2 a.m. when she was remanded without bond. So the, uh, the case will now be in the hands of the county attorney. While in our custody at the conclusion of whatever happens with the court case, she will then be returned to Pocatello to their Department of Corrections. Uh, so I want to thank them for their cooperation and facilitation of this also. And she's already been convicted of two counts of murder. So it's like, well, why is she being extradited again? Because she's already been convicted. And this is kind of like the same thing that happened with Ted Bundy, who was a Mormon, by the way. 
Ted Bundy was he was convicted of the sorority massacre. They retried him on another case where he um, murdered the little girl at the elementary school in order to make sure that in the future, in case there was something that got tossed out on a technicality or there was a germ malfeasance or the judge or some kind of a due process er error or some kind of any technicalities that Lori Vallow will never see the light of day. So she's going to Arizona to face additional murder charges so that she will never breathe the fresh air again. I'm glad because this is for, I believe, is this conspiracy to murder her, was it fourth husband, Charles Vallow? Is that his name? I, I, yes, I believe that yeah. it is for the Charles Vallow, yes. Yeah. So, like, she's in deep, you know, that girl. Uh, and yet, and, and you know, her photograph, I kind of laughed when I saw it because, you know, it's like the portrait of Dorian Gray. Yeah. Her her, her countenance is, is showing that um you know she's not the beauty that she once was that had all these people falling at her feet she's um you know Lori's in deep deep doo-doo for what she's done this is a murder this is a multiple murder not not only husbands and wives of boyfriends or you know ex-wives of chad daybell now they were were they still married when she killed anyway she's killed so many people i've lost track yeah. And the brother that she hired to kill her husband mm -hmm. is also dead. So we didn't even know. And that's a bit funky. We don't really know how he died. They said natural causes. But, you know, she's she's really good at what she does. Nobody, yeah. You know. yeah. So, um, yeah, I hope she never does see the light of day. Uh, she doesn't deserve to. But, you know, yeah. I heard from her sister or cousin that she's ex fully expecting the prison to, you know, there be an earthquake and she walks out yeah. free. Yeah or burns down and she comes through unscathed. Yep. Yeah, Rebecca, what do you think about uh, Lori Vallow and her being transferred over to Arizona? Well, I think Arizona needs to get ready for a media frenzy. If Idaho was any indication, they're definitely going to follow it. There's public interest like crazy. And, you know, I think about that when somebody's committed multiple crimes and you try them for one, and of course they get a life sentence. But then I think about the family members, you know, they, they need to have basically, not to be a cliche, but their day in court. You know, you need to see the person prosecuted and punished for killing or attempting to kill your relative too. And like Lila said, there are so many, the body count is just incredible. And I know she has this view that this is just one of her many lives, right? And she's so special and a goddess. And you're right, something's gonna happen. The sea's gonna part and the jail's gonna fall into the sea and she's gonna walk right out. So I know she has that idea. And you know, maybe it's kinder that she does have that because if she ever wakes up, I say this all the time and looks at the reality of what she did, I can't even imagine. Well, that's the crazy thing is that what the, the article says is that she was in good spirits. She was yeah. chatty. She was yeah. having a good time during yeah. this transfer because she was out of prison getting to see the, you know, being driven along and having a great time about it. And she doesn't have a care in the world. She thinks that somehow she's going to be exonerated that whatever spirits or deities that she worships or, or pays homage to are going to come to her rescue. And that we're going to see something like the book of Mormon, where the, the people were broken out of prison, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Alma and Amulek, I think were freed from prison in the book of Mormon. This is the type of mindset that we're dealing with. It's like an alternative reality and it all sprang out from Mormonism. That's the whole idea that I'm on a divine mission that you guys can't understand. You know, I, I'm working with a different operating book. And if you could only read my instruction manual, then you would know what what it is that I'm doing. But you can't see my instruction manual. I'm the only one who can commune with the divine. And therefore, what I'm doing is perfectly justified. So she doesn't have a concern in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's an incredibly harmful mindset. Any last thoughts on this one? Um, I was going to say that her testimony the statement that she made at the very end when she was convicted, that shows exactly what you're talking about. She thinks her children are just fine. She communicates with them every day. She communicates with Tammy, her new best friend on the other side. Everybody's fine. And it all happened the way it was meant to happen. And, and it's going to work out with her in jail too. And it's like I said, I hope she never wakes up from that. I think that is the only thing that's keeping her from just complete insanity. And if she ever does realize what she did, I mean, can you even imagine being in that situation? And I think that's why there's so much fascination nationally and internationally with this. It's going to be a feeding frenzy when this trial happens. I think later this summer, I think, is when it's supposed to be. I hope yeah. she does wake up. She needs a slap in the face. And yeah. she also thinks that her kids, she didn't kill them. Yeah. They were already gone. They were inhabited by, uh, you know, zombies or dark mm -hmm. spirits. 
So she didn't kill them. They were already out of their body. That's what this, the, the mentality here, that visions of glory book, and mm -hmm. then Chad Gabel and all the other, you know, those, those prophecies uh, the, from Avram Gileadi. I mean, it goes back a ways um, that this is Mormonism gone bonkers. And it's, uh, it's yeah. pretty scary stuff. That is. We're going to be following it here on the Mormon News Roundup. Well, you can follow us. We're on TikTok. We're on Instagram. If you can leave us a comment about what you think is going to happen in the Lori, B Lori Vallow trial, the <laughs> Dave L. Vallow trial, then we'd be very, very grateful for that. And we're still in the legal section here. There's so much legal machinations that are happening this week. Every single case we've covered this week is le legality. And this is uh, residents are suing Wasatch County over Heber Valley Temple approval. This is uh, released here November 30th by Grace uh, Durfler from a KPCW here. They're getting together. They're suing Wasatch County arguing that the recent approval plans for the Hebrew Valley Temple are illegal. And Re Rebecca, I know that you've been covering this very, very carefully. Let me just read this to you and get your thoughts. It says the plaintiff's attorney, which is Robert Mansfield, has described the temple project as spot zoning. Mm -hmm. In order to see this project to fruition, the county really ignored its own ordinances and its own procedures and policies. So spot zoning is the idea that this temple would, you know, is only approved for this one little spot and they uh, ignored every single zoning <laughs> A requirement from the county, from the city, and everything else, and they approved this temple in a way that was illegal, and now the residents are banding together and suing. I know you've been covering this on the Mormonish podcast. What's your thoughts? Yes, we have been covering it. In fact, just about two hours ago, we did an episode with one of the residents, I mean, the citizens group that is suing, and we're going to be putting that episode out on Mormonish podcast on Wednesday morning, so look for that, also talking about Cody, and that's exactly right. Um, Zoning laws were changed. Ordinance were, cha were changed. Everything was changed. Everyone bent over backwards on a city and county level to make sure that this temple can go where it is not at all zoned for in any way. So, and and the, the information that the residents would like to get out is that this is not a done deal. People thought there's a vote. They voted to go ahead. No, at that point, the citizens group is activated, and that's why you see two lawsuits and a referendum. They are going to be gathering signatures. They're, they're, they're questioning the legality of exactly how the process happened. So they have just begun to fight, basically, if you want to say it that way. But they couldn't do anything until it played out in the legal system. You know, the vote, of course, almost unanimous. One person said no, was go ahead with the temple despite all this spot zoning. And now they've been activated and there's a lot going forward. So there are ways to support them. I and mean, you can look for them online. And, and these are just residents that are fighting this, residents with their own money trying to to fight this so. yeah and lila this is utah it used to be the temples used to get just get pushed through with no problems we're starting to see pushback <laughs> even in the great and spacious beehive people are pushing back against these massive structures yeah well they're building them everywhere like every street corner there's a church and a temple so like uh it's a it's a bit much and especially in heber i think this monstrosity they've planned is going to be 200 feet high at its tallest point that's just the height of the Salt Lake Temple, but this is Heber. This is out in a in a uh, agricultural area. This is not a big city. This is not downtown, you know, Salt Lake City where the temple is. That one's 210 feet high at its highest point. Heber is going to be upwards of 200, and the people and the lights, you know, the lights on the temple, they don't. They want the dark night sky there. This isn't a rural uh, agricultural community. They don't want that. No, they absolutely don't. And this isn't the only legal uh, issue that's happening with a temple this week. Again, Cody, Wyoming Temple, again, this is still being battled. This is, you know, the residents in Cody are not giving up. The LDS Church doesn't want 4,000 public records admitted into the latest temple lawsuit. And it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has said during a Monday court hearing that it opposes having all of those public records and the 19 affidavits added as evidence to the, co uh, the, to the lawsuit opposing the church's planned temple in Cody. Rebecca, why doesn't the church want these uh, public records uh, introduced into this lawsuit? Oh, there was such a good reason for that, for sure. So basically, the residents are suing, saying the planning and zoning board was misled when they voted um, to go forward with the temple. And they were misled by the city planner, who is LDS. So the citizens group was able to get, through Freedom of Information Act, all these emails and texts between the city planner, between people in the city, 
between the church and they've been pouring over these. We went to Cody, my co-host on Mormon Church, Landon and I, we talked to these residents and like, they're literally, you know, they've got a whiteboard. They are going over these, these texts and these emails and they've pulled out some really interesting things that have been talked about in articles before. And they've definitely been able to prove that the city planner had information that wasn't correct and was misleading the zoning board. So of course the church does not want any of this information admissible in court. And what's interesting to me is that the city of Cody also doesn't want this information to get out. Why, you might ask, because it makes them look like they're not managing things very well, because basically the planning and zoning board voted without having the full information. They were misled and confused. And this is what the lawsuit is about. We need to take this back to the zoning board. We need to give them accurate information. And then we need to see what they would really vote for. Now, of course, it's different from Heber because this is not a predominantly LDS um, city council or zoning board or any of that. But there's a huge LDS influence and they have a lot of pull there. The commonality between the two, of course, is the divisive nature of it. Both communities are in complete turmoil over this. There are some very negative feelings. Uh, it's really sad to see what's happening to these communities, really sad. And again, to be really clear, none of these citizens group oppose a temple or a place of worship. They just want it to be built in a place that is zoned for that. That's all they're asking. Yeah, and Lila, look at this from this article. It says the public records reveal that multiple members of the Cody Planning and Zoning Board suspected that the city planner and attorney had conflicts of interest with the church that influenced the advice that they gave to the board about the LDS Temple project. So it's amazing to see that when a members of the church have a conflict of interest, they don't recuse themselves yeah. because a temple that's considered like a divine mandate. When the when the headquarters church headquarters says we need a temple in Cody, that's basically saying that God needs a temple in Cody. Mm -hmm. So no, they're not going to recuse themselves if they have a conflict of interest, which we've seen time and time again. No, they're going to put try to push it over the finish line in almost any way possible, really being really pushing the boundaries of what is considered legal or even moral. I would agree. I would agree. But this seems to be the theme right now uh, in all aspects of Mormonism. It's not it's not about what's legal. It's not about what's moral. It's about money. It's the almighty dollar. And that's what this is always about. It's that and power and control. So I'm not surprised that, you know, they push these things through and they use, they, they use God, you know, as the reason, um, God has nothing to do with this. <laughs> so I don't, I don't even know what to say. I, I boycott that the judge here, because this has been in litigation for a long period of time, mm -hmm. it's gone back and forth, multiple, four lawsuits, I believe, in this particular case alone, from the, the suing the, the zoning board, suing suing the, the church, suing, uh, you know, the, the Preserve Our uh, Neighborhoods, Preserve Our Cody Neighborhoods uh, organization as well has brought a lawsuit. And the judge has planned to rule before Christmas on evidence permitted in the LDS Temple case. This has been approved. It's been unapproved. It's been approved. It's been put on hold. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of machinations here. And that's the issue here is that when you try to push through a giant structure into a mostly non-LDS historic small town that is really not, a, it's not zoned appropriately, it's in the wrong place, it's in a residential neighborhood, you're going to see an incredible amount of pushback from the residents. And that's what we're seeing here. These these time, these residents of Cody, Wyoming, which I believe has like 10, 13,000 people yeah. in it, right, Rebecca, something yeah. like that. They're it's banding awesome. together and they're, tr it's like David against Goliath because yeah, the church has has $300 billion mm -hmm. and the preserve our Cody neighborhoods. You know, the, the, the people in Cody yeah. are generally not high on the socioeconomic status. These are not hedge fund managers mm -hmm. and, and Wall Street investors. These are just a lot of mom and pop, small business yep. people, ranchers, farmers, and they're trying to take down the Goliath. And the sad part about it is, is that, you know, if I were to place a, a bet on this, a, a Mitt Romney 10,000 Mormon bet, I would yeah. bet on the church that the church is probably going to win this one. Yeah. Any last thoughts on Cody? Yeah, I know. But, you know, it, it's a stand that they're taking. And when you look at the two stories together, that's what's so interesting. The perspective that I have being on Mormonish is being able to interview and visit and spend time with both groups. We went to Cody and we met the people and we saw the site. It's it's the same modus operandi. You, you just see it tweaked a little bit depending on how it works. And they're doing the same thing in both places. And I think it's I wish 
a bigger news outlet. I mean, I know you're big, but a bigger <laughs> one would pick this up, the tale of two temples, because the two together is so interesting. And whether or not they can win or prevail, I mean, I hope they can, but I'm kind of like you. I think, who knows? It's a Goliath. At least the story's out there, and it's a cautionary tale. And going forward, I think people will be more aware. Maybe that's the best we can hope for, but that's important too. Yeah, it absolutely is. And believe it or not, uh, ladies, that's the end of the legal section. Every single one of those articles was the church being or, or church members being involved in legal machinations, all of which were, are, are in a negative light. It's incredible. And this is just one week. week. Every okay. single one of the articles that we put in here was from this week only in yeah. the last six days. Yeah. All of the legal machinations, the church is being sued left, right, and center. And we didn't even get to every single one of the church lawsuits this week. This is just the wow. highlights of what's happening. And it used to just be that the church was like unquestioned. And what they did, especially in Utah, it's just what they said went. And now we're seeing people saying, uh-uh, we are going to hold our line in the sand. Why is there just so much legal machinations around church members and the church in general? Back when I was a kid, back you know in the 1990s, you wouldn't see any of this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. What has changed in the zeitgeist that has made the church so primed for lawsuits. The internet, everybody knows what's happening. Don't you think that's part of it? I mean, before, like you said, you did not know it was the 90s. Things could be kept under wraps. Not now, people are watching. Everybody knows, everybody's talking. Look at the women who are suing the doctor. One woman thought she was alone. It didn't happen to anyone else. She was afraid to tell anyone. Then she connects with someone else that it happened to. There's safety in numbers. You can band together and you can make a difference and make a change. Yeah, Lila, why do you think that there's so much just in one week of church legal machinations? Why? It's incredible. Yeah, I, I think the internet is all, it's, I agree with that. But I also think that the church has become more and more egregious. It's, it's become more and more empowered because they have so much money. They have more money than God and they, and they are wielding that like a sword. They think, hey, we can build a temple anywhere we want. Well, you don't like it? Sue us see what happens. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's like they've become so emboldened by the power that they have. I don't think they think twice. I think they think they're going to win any lawsuit that comes up. And that also makes them feel stronger. And each time they grow and, you know, exponentially in their minds of the power that they have. And it just causes more and more disgusting behavior. Yeah, it kind of feeds on itself because the church usually wins these things because the church yeah. usually the church has the deepest pockets. You yeah, know, the church has the best law firms. So they bring in yeah. these specialty specialized law firms. We all know the church's go-to law firm is Curtin McConkie, but then it will bring in other law firms mm -hmm. in Cody, in yeah. Heber, in the Huntsman lawsuit, in the Arizona sex abuse case. They will bring in the best of the best, and they will have that entire firm locked up with the hundreds of maybe potentially hundreds of millions of dollars in legal fees that yes. the church pays out every single year to crush the opposition in even the most mundane aspects of just move a temple from here to here or move a visitor center from here to here or or just do things slightly different you know um you know put your temple in a place that's not going to require to pump out a million gallons of groundwater a day you know just small to the church when they have as much money as they have and when they feel that God has told Russell M. Nelson that the temple location is supposed to be here. So he yeah. gets the, you know, the, the, the way that these temples, you know, people go out, they give him a couple of different plots of land in Cody. He prays about it and boom, that's where it is. And so how can you compromise? If you compromise on anything, then it's how, how could God be wrong? Because God said the temple was supposed to go there. So if you're compromising, then could he have been wrong about his prayer? That's unthinkable. That's why a no compromising organization. That's right. Yeah, and God wants the temple to be seen because that's the issue with both of these locations in Heber and Cody. It's in a very prominent area where it's going to be seen. And it's it's interesting because in talking to one of the residents today on, on my podcast, she talked about the meetings where they were going to vote. And everybody stood up exactly what you just described and bore their testimony of the temple. No talk of zoning, no talk of law, no talk of anything like that. It was all about how they felt and their ancestors and the council members did the same thing. Nobody talked about the law and it's a legal process. That other part of it, how you feel about it, that doesn't have a place in it. But in this case, it did. And it won. 
Yeah, absolutely. Now, a couple of last articles here to round things out here. And this is from the church news itself. This has really gone very viral here. And Prager U here has asked who a modern prophet was. I found this to be very remarkable. Latter-day Saints responded. So it's the official count for Prager U as followers to respond with who a modern prophet was. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the most common reply was the church members. They flooded in into the uh t into twitter uh, f formerly known as twitter onto x and you're supposed to fill in on tweet this out quote blank is a modern prophet and the, one of the highest answers was russell m nelson including from mike lee he said russell m nelson obviously and you see this what's incredible is if you if you take this is what was uh, a tw uh, trending virally from the prager u all of the responses here are Russell M. Nelson, Russell M. Nelson, Russell M. Nelson, Joseph uh, Joseph Smith, the, the the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Everybody is flooding the internet, and it's um it's really gone viral here. What are your thoughts on this one, Lila? Ew, it's just gross. Ew, it's like, you know, I mean, anywhere else. The problem is the church is everywhere. It may not be huge in numbers compared to you know Catholicism or whatever. But it's got its little fingers everywhere. And so there's no sacred place where Mormons aren't going to band together and make their voice heard. Like they're just everywhere. And it's just it, like they overtook the whole, was it Twitter? You know, um, it, it's embarrassing to me because what about the other prophets of other religions? You know, nothing was said because they don't, they haven't been brainwashed the way that we, sorry, I'm using some derogatory terms, inflammatory terms, but I do feel like, you know, Mormons will band together. They will band together and speak up. You ask them any question, they're going to answer, you know, the, the Sunday school answer and everyone's going to do it all together. And boom, there you have it. It takes over the internet. Yeah. And Rebecca, here's the best reply here. Here you go. You bet it is my organic. Here it is. Russell M. Nelson. <laughs> Looks like a prophet to me. This was like the most common photo that was tweeted back. What are your thoughts on Prager U going viral and Russell M. Nelson taking center stage? Oh, I agree with Lila. I mean, unfortunately, it makes everybody look extremely culty that they're putting a name of a man who probably nobody really knows who that is. I'd be curious to see. I mean, I wonder if they asked the question sort of metaphorically. You know, what, what were some of the other answers? Were they... Were they listing faith leaders, um, industry leaders, um, people who were doing service, charity? I'd like to know what other people, when Mormons hear the word prophet, they're obviously going to think of an ecclesiastical leader in the church. But I don't think that has the same meaning for other people. So I'd be curious to see what some of the other names are. It did very much remind me of relatives that I have that as long as I've known them, and these are in-laws for 30 years, they have written in, in any election, the prophet's name. Their vote is always, even a presidential election, the prophet. Wow. And in their mind, that is what they're supposed to do. So, yeah, very triggering to see how many people just, you know, tipped their hand and rushed out there and said, Russell Nelson, Russell Nelson, Russell Nelson. You know, you may as well say, well, no, I won't say that. That's inflammatory. You're right. You know, I was going <laughs> to say something about Heaven's Gate and Doe, but I'm not going to. So, <laughs> it's just, yeah, or, or, you know, um, what's his name uh, that... Warren Jeffs. Warren Jeffs. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah same thing. Luckily, they don't all have internet connections, apparently. <laughs> no, they don't have internet well, connections. And there's only about 15,000 FLDS. So I don't think it would yeah. be enough to sway. But, you know, my favorite guy on there out on Twitter is Kulch. And he put out this, uh, he he re he fixed the uh, fixed the headline here for us. It says, Gregor, you asked who a modern prophet was. And Latter-day Saints responded by annoying the entire internet. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> That's, exactly. Yes. That's basically what happened. That's basically what happened here. So uh, I'm going to have uh, the culture on the uh, Mormon News Roundup here coming up shortly. Good. Here, Times Square here, guys. Times Square digital billboards reflect the nativity and an invitation to share the Savior's life this Christmas. And it's the giving machines. The church went ahead and bought Times Square. Once again, the, the church has bought Times Square a number of times. It must be a multi-million dollars just to lock up all of these lights on Times Square. It's got to be at least several million dollars, maybe even $10 million. But the church, especially for its giving machine efforts here, and here we have the church's lawyer, I mean apostle, uh, <laughs> Quentin Cook,
<laughs> um, yeah, he, there he is with his uh, Quentin Cook and his wife, uh, Sister Mary Cook. They're in Times Square, flanked by church security. Don't forget the church security is 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 close behind, keeping an eye on what's happening here. And they bought all of Times Square to highlight the giving machines and what's happening here. What are your thoughts on the church shelling out the dough for Times Square and New York City? This is another absolutely horrific thing that I saw because it's like Jesus up there is probably if, if there is a Jesus, he's disgusted. He's sick to his stomach watching this. This is the opposite of what Jesus would want. The money that they spent to do that could have saved an entire small country and given fed them all. You know, it's like, where are your priorities? And here's the other part that I hate about these giving machines that are in my mall that I see all the time. We've got the missionaries down there working it. The members have already paid their tithing. They've already paid fast offerings. They've already made donations to the missionary fund, to the uh, continuing ed education fund. And now we're asked to do this too. Not that I have a problem helping poor people, but the church has 150, 250 billion dollars, billion dollars. What they could feed all these people, buy all the goats, do all the things that it's listed in each of those giving machines times a hundred and not even put a dent in their wallet. And yet they're asking the members who are struggling to make their, our, our, our house payments or whatever we're doing, they're asking for more, 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 more. And yet they don't give a dime out of their pocket. And yet they get all the accolades and it's so, it's so disgusting. Just that whole scene of Times Square made my stomach turn. It really did. I, I'm, I'm grossed out. Rebecca, how come Jesus always needs the church to bankroll his endeavors? How come he just can't write the check himself? Or better yet, just turn on the lights on his own. How come the church has to be the one who, is Jesus strapped for cash? I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm just legitimate question here. You got to have faith. That's what oh. it is. It's all about so, you know, to Lila's point, it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes by Max Van Cito, which is, if Jesus were to come back today and see everything that was going on in his name, he would never stop throwing up. That's a great quote. And and actually, it, it's such it's such a convoluted situation, the giving machine. Mormonish, we actually uh, went to the giving machine yesterday. We did an episode on it. We talked to a CEO of one of the nonprofits in the past that has received money from the giving machine. So we're putting out an episode on Thursday about this because exactly what Lila said, the church could just reach into its back pocket and fund all of this and more. I mean, it literally makes, I think, a million dollars of interest every hour, something like that. And people have already given. And so they are very much a middleman here. If you take the church out of the equation of the giving machine, then it's not needed. Someone is already giving money. However, um, the publicity that they get from that, that's really what they're after, of course, because it looks like they're doing this tremendous good in the world. What we did find, though, is the bottom line is the people who need these goods and services are getting the goods and services. So if you can look past, as Lila says, gross and all of that, it really is going through legitimate, wonderful charitable organizations and people are being helped. And when I was at the mall yesterday, I saw especially the kids jumping up and down, pointing, I want a chicken, mom. I mean, there is an excitement. There's a hype. Um, like Lila said, there are missionaries or people, I think from local wards, they were wearing lanyards. There's a giant place like a red carpet where you can get your picture taken in front of the giving machine. The church definitely wants as much positive PR as, as they can get. So, all that stuff I know a lot of people have real problems with, but the bottom line is the people are getting the goods and services. So I don't know, convoluted. Okay, well, here's a parody video to go along with this. You know, you've heard of Give Said the Little Stream. Well, this one is Give Said the Red Machine. Let me get your reaction to this one. Give Said the Red Machine. Give, oh, give, sheep and pigs. Give Said the Red Machine. We'll take credit for
That's a real testimony builder, isn't it? It's very mm. inspiring. I think they should put that in the new hymn book. It's it's absolutely I right up that. there with all the yeah. other songs. So. <laughs> Interestingly, this uh, CEO of a nonprofit from the past that we talked to said that they did not feel that a lot of people even knew it was the church that was doing this. Like they, people would come across, they talked about a celebrity, one of the Avengers, I won't mention which one, you know, that had stumbled across one and said, this is incredible and started promoting. So the idea is really fun. You know, this cool red machine kind of beckoning to you. But this person said, no one's going to join the church because of this. They're just going to think it's something fun for the holidays and then move on. It's, it's not going to have the impact that they think it's going to have. So, and, and I kind of agree with that. Yeah, I mean, it's been rolled out, I believe, this year is the most amount of cities that it's in. I believe it is mm -hmm. 51 cities, and the church generates something like, I believe it is between 20 and $30 million mm -hmm. a year using these yeah. red machines, which the church generates, from my humble estimation, the church generates about $70 million a day. So out of the entire Christmas time season, that would equate to about three, three hours of church income. Yeah. So we're trying to put mm -hmm. things into perspective here yeah. that these giving machines are mostly about PR. And they're really not about the bottom line. They're about a, kind of like an evangelism that says, hey, if you donate to us, look, we're doing all of these incredible things when the church could easily, with the stroke of a pen, you know, just completely <laughs> buy all of the items that were in this for everyone who is donating. They could buy them instantly without any issue, just using the uh, just using the interest on its number one investment, which is Apple. The church has two point seven billion dollars in Apple. The dividends from that stock alone, if for just a couple of days, will do everything that the red machines are doing on their own. Um, or if they would match. That was another right. thing that we thought of, you know, is there matching? And then some people think there is. Of course, my co-host on Mormonish Land, and he's like, no, I have a problem with that too, because the matching would be for tithe, from tithing funds. People have already paid, like Lila said, you know, they've already donated. They do not need to donate again. The church could easily make these donations and get the positive PR. So that's what I say. Very frustrating. But they can get the PR from doing, actually yeah. donating themselves. Yeah. They could, they yeah. could just say, hey, you know what? We reached into our very, very, very deep pockets and we pulled out a few billion dollars and look what we did. And they get a lot of uh, positive PR from that. So I just think something is, it's just, it makes Jesus cry. I just know it does. This is not how he, not that he wouldn't want us all helping. See, I'm, I'm all about that part of it. It's the way that it's done and the fact that the church is taking the credit for it. Just like that little song said. Yep. yep. Giving give said the red machine. So hey, we're on Instagram. Let us know your thoughts on the red machine on the giving. Let us know. I mean, uh, is the church doing the right thing here? It's raising millions of dollars. Or are we being a little too cynical? Let us know. We'd be very grateful for that. Now, the church has also released this week an updated requirements. And this is again, there's a big news week here. The church has updated its policy for creating or changing unit boundaries. So the church has like 31,000 congregations, about 15,000 of those are buildings. And the first presidency notified stake ward and and other church leaders of the change in a letter. So this has really gone viral here because it's, um, well, it's just very, very interesting in what the change is. And here, let me pull up this, uh, this document here, which will show you. This is what is happening here. We're identifying members who participate in meaningful ways and they're changing the, we have a current requirement and a new requirement. Rebecca, what's happening here as far as these new requirements for making stakes? Well, within the United States and Canada, they're definitely lowering, lowering the bar. Fewer members needed for stakes and wards and fewer priesthood holders. When I looked at that, it just made me tired when I thought about the amount of work that people are going to need to do because you can look like you're growing. You can show, look, we have this many wards, but each ward has fewer people and people working really hard at the top to do what needs to be done. I also take note, I talked about this with Margaret Toscano today on an episode, no women at all mentioned in this matrix. Right. How many priesthood holders do you need? How many youth do you need? There's absolutely no mention of, you know, because a woman's not fulfilling a priesthood calling. So it is interesting. And then internationally, the numbers have been bumped up a little bit. Now, that's kind of a question. I've talked to some people about that. And they're thinking sometimes the international wards tend to, I don't know, fall apart, crumble maybe a little bit. And so maybe by pushing those numbers up the matrix, it looks a little bit better optically. If it's a little bit harder to create a ward to make sure it's stable to begin with than to have to close them. Cause that's the last thing that you want to be seen. But again, this will just look, it'll look great. You know, we're going to have lots of wards, smaller number in those wards. And so what happens in there, I think a lot of people exhausted, probably a lot of 
caffeine maybe to keep people going. I don't know. Yeah, uh, Lila, let me ask you, why do you think that the church is lowering the number of people, especially men, basically just men? Why are they lowering the number of people that is required for a ward? Why are they lowering the, the number that is required for a stake? Why is the church lowering the number for all of its entities here? If the church, I, I keep hearing the message that the church, in fact, Quentin Cook in the Young Adult Devotional two weeks ago said that the church is going gangbusters, is growing. It, it is the stone cut out of the mountain. Why are we lowering the number of people that is necessary for all of these units if things are going so well. Well, Quentin Cook just made a prophecy. So they have to fill that prophecy, fulfill it. So what they're going to do is require less people to create the wards, branches, stakes. Therefore, yes, it's growing. We have more. We have more wards, and branches, and stakes. It's, it's a total uh, optic thing. It has nothing to do with the reality of ex more members. In fact, I think the members are decreasing by droves. But we're gonna we're gonna mess with the boundaries and we're gonna change the rules and meanings of words and we're gonna make it sound like everything's wonderful and it's growing. And the fact that they have zero women mentioned, the first thing that came to my mind was then they should all just stop going. Women should just boycott it, just stop going. Mm -hmm. Hey, you don't need us. Clearly, you don't need us in the ward, stake, or any other level. What if we just stop going? And maybe kept our kids home with us so there was no young men or young women. Yeah, that's the crazy thing. If every woman who's in the church stopped going to church immediately, only a couple of small things would change. You would The Relief yeah. Society would stop and the young right. women's would stop. But all of the proselytizing, all of the church callings, yeah. all the hierarchies, all the baptisms, all of the callings, the rest of the church would continue to function perfectly normally. If yeah. every man in the church stopped, atten uh, stopped attending or took their names off the rolls, the church would cease existing right. in an oh. instant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think us women, since we're so underrated and unneeded, should just stop going. Like, they don't care. They don't care about women. Clearly, they don't care about women. They're throwing them off the stand. They don't, you know, it's all, uh, once again, smoke and mirrors. Get those auxiliary, whatever they're called now, up on the stand so that it looks good from a PR standpoint. But the way they actually treat women is, is nothing compared to that. And so I just say, we should all just stop going. See how the church likes that. Maybe they won't care. They'll just continue forward and we can have our Sundays back. Brunch. I think. Brunch. <laughs> Sunday brunch. brunch. <laughs> and I know, Rebecca, you put together a, a track small with this. What's going on with this track small? I wrote. <laughs> Here's uh, Captain Kirk. He's got these new stake organizations up here on the talk, and he's giving a briefing to his uh, bridge team here. And it says, this will allow us to pretend there's growth through creating more wards with fewer people in them. And as an added bonus, those members will be so overworked that they won't be able to research truth claims online. And uh, Chekhov says, a brilliant captain. I think that pretty much sums it up. You do a good accent. You do a good checkup <laughs> accent. And, you know, I just was thinking while Lila was talking that um, this is kind of what they did with missions recently, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They created all this matrix of these new missions, but then it turned out, you know, smaller number of people in it. So smoke and mirrors. It looks great on paper, but it's not the reality at all. Yeah, that way we'll be able to continue to say that we the stakes are mm -hmm. continuing to increase. The mm -hmm. wards, they're continuing to increase. Everything will continue to increase as long as you make everything so tiny in the long run that pretty soon, you know, the amount of people who are going to be in the ward will be infinitesimal and they will almost all be men because that is what is necessary to change wards, to split boundaries, to have the number of stakes. It's all about tithe paying Melchizedek priesthood holding men. That's the only metric in the church that really matters is that particular small demographic because they are the ones who have the authority and have to run everything with the approval through them. Just real quick, my, my oldest son went to Mongolia on his mission right after they had been, it had been closed for quite some time. And he said that they could baptize girls, women and girls all day long. There were tons of them coming to the church. They weren't allowed to proselyte, but they were coming wanting to know what this beautiful building was in the middle of, you know, yurts and, and dung huts. And um, they said they couldn't find any men that weren't drunk. And, and so they couldn't create wards and stakes. They had tons of women. And that just really shocked me. I was like, well, you know, that's going to cause a problem because women can't hold the priesthood. So what are you going to do? Yeah. How does he feel about the new Mongolian temple that's been announced, by the way? You know, I haven't asked him about that, but uh, I'm sure he's thrilled. It's going to be very hard to man that temple without yes, tithe-paying Melchizedek priesthood yes, holding 
males, that's going to be very hard to man that particular temple. Yeah. Well, the answer is obvious. Women, priesthood. The answer is obvious. It would solve every problem. A couple last articles to get you through here. Uh, we got to get you out of here in an hour and a half, which is what we try to do here. And this one has gone viral. There's just been so many viral videos this week. It's incredible. Elder Bednar, um, he, he gives a lot of insights into his uh, personal life, or maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. We'll find out from this article here. Elder Bednar shares a day in the life of an apostle, part two. So it's a new video. He, he launched part one, which is where he was working at the church office building. And now part two is where he's out among the people. And there's Susan Bednar. And there's David Bednar. And he's talking about what he's doing. He's meeting, greeting the people, greasing the palms and what he's doing. They released an entire video that goes through this. I want to play this video here and get your reaction to what's going on with David Bednar and his behind the scenes look. Hi, it's me, David Bednar. My first video was such an amazing success, so we're back with part two. A bunch of haters said I appeared too insulated and robotic in part one, so for this video, I decided to get out and rub elbows with the commoners. I even got to bring Susan. See, I do let her out of the house. She's not completely miserable. On Saturday morning, we gathered for a two-hour sausage fest with the local priesthood leadership. We discussed many important male topics. Hey, look, no women on the stand. Yeah. Just as it should be. After that, we let some women into the chapel. I took this opportunity to remind them of God's grand design for them, which is to get married, have children, and most importantly, make sure dinner is on the table. Notice once again, no women on the stand. After putting the sisters in their place, it was time to remind the youth of theirs. They were ecstatic to attend a youth devotional featuring yours truly as the speaker. I was happy to instruct the youth on such topics as modest is hottest, keeping your hands off your little factory, and blood atonement. They loved it. After the devotional, I forced Susan to join me in shaking the hands of these disgusting kids. Misery loves company. Somebody get me some Purell. Stat. After a good night's rest in a five-star hotel, we attended a state conference. I enjoy these assignments because I'm always the most important person in the building. <laughs> Susan had been a good girl, so I allowed her to join me on the stand. Mm. What can I say? I'm a total sweetheart. Wow. After the conference, I was forced to shake more disgusting hands. <laughs> it was gross. <laughs> Before getting the H-E double hockey sticks out of Ephraim, the director suggested I attempt to interact with the child. It's well known that I'm not fond of human contact, especially the tiny germ-ridden kind. But I made the ultimate sacrifice and did it. Oh my gosh. I'm just like Jesus. <laughs> All right, guys. That's a parody video, obviously. That's a pretty good parody. Is it? Though? Is it? <laughs> I saw his mouth moving just like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, that, that scene at the end with the little child. I mean, I watched the original. I have not seen this one yet, which is why I'm laughing so hard. I'm crying. But yeah, it was so awkward the way he's trying to talk to that poor little good kid. Oh, oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. No, <laughs> terrified. Uh, yeah. No, that was great. That was really good. I hope everybody watches that. That was really good. Who did that? Was that you, Demas? No, that's Cultural Hall. That's yeah, Cultural that's Hall. Cultural. Oh, yeah. They did the first one too. It was so good. That was so, great. I love it. Yeah. You know, he, he doesn't go to the gym. We don't get to see him, you know, uh, watching a BYU sporting event, like knocking back a cold uh, Diet Coke. You know, we don't get to see that. Every the, the videos that he has, he's always at work every moment of every single day. He is working for the Lord and you never get to see one little yeah. thing. He's never mowing the yard. He's never, you know, he's never walking the dog. How come we don't get to see? You're trying to personalize someone. You're trying to humanize someone. David Bednar is famously robotic. So you're he is a robot. So you're That's trying to he you're trying to humanize him, and instead of making a real human video, it's a propaganda piece in which you know there's no humanization taking place. Nothing. Yeah. No, I think he is an, an alien. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> like if you peeled back the face, it would just be circuits, you know, going. <laughs> like, then you could hear like, Cylon pushing buttons, you know, telling him to, you know, I don't know. Yeah, uh, cyborg or something. Yeah, that's that's sad. Yeah, no. you know, we never get to see him in the Ensign Peak stock report meeting or meeting with the church lawyers to talk about covering up so uh, child sex abuse. We don't get to see those meetings. Everything that he does is supposedly ecclesiastical. 
but we never get to see the for profit stuff where he's meeting with the people to talk about City Creek Mall. How much is the utilities bill this month? How much are we making from Let's Go Shopping? All of those commercial things. Oh, that's a that's the, don't ask about those. It's only the ecclesiastical, and there's just there's no humanization here. You know, no. if you or want, honesty. Yeah, it's a big propaganda piece. Now, I have a, a Twitter reaction I think that's uh, very, very interesting here. Let me pull this up here for you, which I, I think this sums, sums it all up with. It, it, this is from Matthew Watkins. It says, these men literally work themselves to death, and they do it with a smile. I never want to hear someone complain about the general authority stipend again. So David Bednar, he's working himself to death. Therefore, we shouldn't criticize him because he's working so hard. In first class airfare and with, you know, everything's catered. Five star. They have the nicest homes, the best cars, everything's yeah. paid for. Yeah, it's rough. It's rough. Yeah, the $260,000 a year that the Widows Might Report says that he's making a large portion, a portion of which is tax exempt. It really feels like more about $350,000 a year, which in Utah goes a long, long way. I, I don't begrudge, especially considering the fact that the apostles also manage for-profit entities, okay, with the Deseret Management Corporation. Uh, the, uh, you know, he was the president of a university. If you look at the University of Utah president, he makes a million dollars. I don't begrudge how much David Bednar makes at all. In fact, he's, he's, he's helping to manage. He's basically on the board of directors of a $300 billion mm -hmm. corporation. Yeah. Okay, if there was another three hundred billion dollar corporation out there, all of those board of directors, all of those executive presidents and vice presidents, they'd be making a heck of a lot more than two hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year. So sure. I don't begrudge him at all for the amount of money that he makes. Now, if only he, if he was only doing ecclesiastical functions, I think that that would be too much. But he's not. He's doing all of the for profit stuff. So I don't begrudge that. What I say is, there's just no humanity here. You have the ability to connect with people on a real level, not staged. This is so staged. It's so fake. Okay. People can tell authenticity. We're not dodos. I was going to say that he will be the prophet sooner than later, probably sooner than later, and he'll be up for a long time. So he's going to have to learn to take those publicity shots of vacuuming in his apartment, of swinging on a swing, of deep sea fishing close to shore. He's going to have to learn to do all of those things. So he may as well start now. <laughs> Two last articles to get you out of here. And these are the most uh, amusing, in my opinion. And the church released your, you know, 10 best gift cards. It's the Christmas season. Hence why we're dressed up. You know, how's my, how's my look here, ladies? My look? Oh, you look very festive. Perfect. Okay. I'm working hard on this. It, it was kind of hard to talk about uh, lawsuits and stuff with this on, but we're in the lighter section here. So the, the Deseret News here, which the church owns, you know, through Deseret Management Corporation has said that there's the 10 best gift cards to give as Christmas presents. And I couldn't believe this here when I read through this, the number one, the number one best gift card, according to the Deseret <laughs> News is Starbucks. Can you believe that? <laughs> wow. Unbelievable, because I thought that the Starbucks was the root of all evil. I thought that if you look at Julie Beck in General Conference, she literally said that one drop of coffee could cause you to lose your eternal salvation and the eternal salvation of your children for generations. And now in 2023, the church is recommending that we go ahead and buy Starbucks gift cards. I am floored here. I can't believe what I'm seeing. <laughs> Well, maybe they think, you know, it's they've got some other healthy options there. We'll just yeah. go through and get those little um, egg, whatever those egg white things are. Oh, yeah, like the little quiche kind of thing. Yeah. Or muffin. Uh, or, uh, or get a muffin. Something like and, that. You know, pass on the latte. That's right. But in, in my day, in my day, I sound like a much older person, even to park in a parking lot of a Starbucks was the appearance of evil. Even if you're going to drive through and you're ordering something that doesn't have any kind of coffee component to it, you still didn't do it because it's the appearance of evil. And now suddenly everyone does it, especially high school students, college students, everyone does it. And here it is as the top gift card. I'm I love it. Good. I love it. I hope that, that the top 15 are aware of yeah. this card option that they've just yeah. promoted. Do they know yeah. about this? Maybe they're frequenting the, the Starbucks. Well, if, Su if Susan's husband, if I see him at a Starbucks, I promise you I'm going to start buying these Starbucks <laughs> gift cards. The moment yeah. that I see him there. Sanctioned. Yeah. Uh, let's just review these. We got Starbucks. We got Sephora. I'm sorry. Um, What is Sephora? That's makeup? Makeup. I was going to say, this is pretty much following the Mormon trajectory right here, right? We've got the makeup. We've got the... It's just a <laughs> I love makeup, too. So there you go. 
Uh, we got Target. We got Abs Disney. That's that's a Mormon favorite for sure. Yeah. The uh, Chick Fil A. Oh, sure. You know that's a, a the anti LGBTQ organizations yep. banding together, right? Perfect. Um, uh, iTunes, Fandango, Visa, eBay, and Home Depot. I just I couldn't believe that <laughs> I saw Starbucks at number Starbucks. one. That's Home awesome. Depot or for the preppers. Got to get that. Oh, in. Okay, that's yeah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, now that does bring us to our featured news article and our final news article of the week here. And announced here, this is unbelievable. Salt Lake is hosting the Winter Olympics once again. They hosted them back in 2002, I believe it was, right? 2002? Mm-hmm. Right? And now that the, the Salt Lake is announced as the preferred host for the 2034 Winter Olympics, it's not a slam dunk, it's not 100%, but the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, expects to make a formal decision, and it looks like Salt Lake is leading the way. It looks like the folks are coming to the Salt Lake City once again here. Here we go again. <laughs> ah, hit it, I was here the first time. Were you living here in 2002, Lila? Were you here for it? Yeah. Yeah. Remember what ah. that was all about, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I have some thoughts, if I can say so. So that's in 10 years, roughly, right? Um. So by then, I'm sure Jesus will have come, don't you think? Oh, yeah. So I'm not sure if Salt Lake will still be oh, yeah. there. But if, let's say, Jesus decides to allow Salt Lake to be a thing, then it would now be the Millennial Olympics, right? So, because it's millennium, right? And so I was thinking that we could repurpose some of the um, buildings in downtown Salt Lake. I was thinking that the temple would be a great, and oh, and the other thing is there's no winter in the millennium. It's always right. summertime. So Correct. it wouldn't be winter Olympics. It would be summer because it's always going to be summer. So the, we could repurpose the temple to be like um, a rock climbing venue. So they would put little toe holds and finger holds. Wouldn't that be epic? Like, you know, with the spires and everything. And if you get up to the top and you honk the horn of Mos or Moroni. And then, and I also thought that like, you know, that's actually a new venue. Um, and, and then the tabernacle, the old tabernacle, you know, you cut off the dome and flip it. And now you have a half pipe for like skateboarding, don't you think? I, I love these ideas. This is this is all fantastic stuff for sure. Right. I mean, we wouldn't even have to build those. They're just there. That's They're already amazing. there. I never thought about the millennium aspect, but you're right, because it is supposed to happen. If you follow the seven seals, it's gonna happen before then. So and then think about this. Everyone will have a like a resurrected perfect body. So yeah. then can everyone just Imagine. be in the Olympics? We're all a power athlete, right? Imagine the participate in that. Yeah. Of the resurrected body olympics yeah exactly like you there would be no there would be no danger involved no. you couldn't Perfect. die nope. so like just beat the tar out of your partner your 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 um competitors and and you know it's just like the strongest um resurrected body wins yeah that's well, I mean, it's really mind-blowing yeah, well, it just kind of reminds me of that Sherry do talk. Are we not all Olympians? I think that's that's kind of reminds me. We would me of all that. be at that point. You <laughs> yeah. would have to like have a numbered system or something. Uh, the segment of the week, which is the Mormon News Roundup poll of the week, because I think that there's a lot that the church needs to do to prepare for the Winter Olympics in 2034. And this is our poll of the week. And that reminds me here, folks, that we do release all of our episodes live on Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we also release the Mormon movie reviews on Monday nights at 9.30 p.m. Standard uh, Eastern Standard Time. If you come into our live chat at that time, you can take this poll along with your humble host. And I'd like you two to be the first one to take our poll. What's the number one thing we need to do to prepare for the Winter Olympics? Okay, so first we should ask Susan's husband for his Uber-inspired guidance since he's going to be running things at this point. Absolutely. And he says, I'm so freaking powerful. <laughs> bow Go, down, you peasants. Bow down, you peasants. Yep, that's a good Lila, one. Lila, does he look rept reptilian there or is it me? Oh, totally. That's a lizard. That's not a human. See, I told you, he's not a human. He, he comes from another... Another world where they're reptilian and, and yeah, he's, he's not a man. And in 10 years, what's he going to look like then? Uh, I think he's going to be even more handsome than he is now. But I think the tongue, I'm waiting for the tongue to come out and kind of lick yes. the eye on this one, you know, just. Right. Yeah, but uh, really, he is going to be running things at that point. The rest of those folks ahead That's of right. him are, they're not going to be holding up that long. So, yes, we if, if the for number one thing we need to do is ask for his guidance because that's the only one who's going to matter because he's going to be a generational prophet. That does, uh, Lila, bring us to number two. Rename the tab cats or no one will know who is singing in the opening ceremonies. 
Let's yeah. have Motown. Yeah. I mean, what, the, what what is the name of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir now again? What is it's the name? Me. Oh Tabernacle God! At, at, yeah. at the square at the of the choir. of the choir of the choir. Nobody the choir knows. formerly known as yeah. It's like Taco de Cole. Yeah. Yeah. These all these words are a victory for Satan to me. So <laughs> I'm still going to call it Mormon Tabernacle Choir. That's what it was. Technically, the name is the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square, which just rolls off the tongue, right? Okay. It's so easy to say. Yeah, Bad we cat. slaughtered it in our attempt. Yeah, but we just we really just need to rename them back to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Otherwise, in the opening ceremony, people are going to be like, who is this? What, yeah, who are these guys? Yeah, they won't they won't they won't yeah so yeah, less tab, uh, which is when there's no Mormon tab. Yeah, Mo tab when we're all filled in and then less tab at the top. Let's rename them so that people have a clue as to who is singing those opening ceremonies. That does bring us to number three, Rebecca. Oh, let's see. To avoid any embarrassing viral videos, ban the black menaces from the Olympic Stadium. Yeah, I think that might happen. Yeah, um, you know, because, you know, they they ask people on BYU, would you rather yeah. uh, murder a puppy or, or uh, have a sip of herbal tea? And they keep murdering the puppy. So if we yeah. want to have a good Mormon image, Lila, in the Olympics, I, if we ban them from the stadium, I think things will go a little bit better for the church. What do you think? Oh, yeah, because they are just menaces to society. Look at them. <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, and uh, how about number four, Lila? Someone Mitt Romney from his cryogenic chamber <laughs> so he can give his signature tedious, tedious patriotic speech. His cryogenic chamber. Look at all the frost on his face and hair. The poor Whoa. guy. He does look like he's very cold in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or how about that? Because he was the last, uh, he was the governor, you know, he was the ambassador or he was the um, representative. Or what was his position? The president of the Olympics, right? He saved the Olympics. He saved the Olympics the last time it was here. It was mismanaged. There was all kinds of corporate fraud. And he came in like a savior to make it all happen. It was quite the big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, that was fulfills that Joseph Smith prophecy that the That's Olympics would be saying. hanging by a thread. The Olympics <laughs> will be hanging by a thread. He's the one mighty and strong. Absolutely. Absolutely. How about number five, uh, Rebecca? Okay. Uh, leave a copy of Boyd Packer's little factory speech in every Olympic village dorm room. That's legit because we've heard the stories of what goes on in those Olympic village <laughs> dorm rooms. So they're going to need this right here. And maybe even more importantly, Mark E. Peterson's pamphlet that gives you 50 ways to avoid masturbation, like tying your hand to the bed frame or not eating spicy foods or leaving the bathroom door open so people can check on you while you're showering. Those kinds of things. This is what the athletes need. Yeah, can we go TMZ for just a little minute? How, how, how would you evaluate Boyd Packer's look there? What do you think? What do you, how do you like the look? <laughs> I think he's working on his little factory right there and it is not happening. Something oh. is not. <laughs> oh, Something's a, a little off. Okay. Well, I feel bad, but yeah, I know. Okay, let's yeah. keep it all. Uh, Lila, how about number six? Ask for prayers for the LDS Olympians because if one of them wins a gold, we know the church is true. Yeah. Hashtag, yeah. hashtag yeah. facts. Yep. You bet. And if they don't win a gold, then we know that it wasn't the Lord's will. That's right. That they didn't you, have the faith to win a gold. Have the faith. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. How about number seven, Rebecca? Um, to help foreign athletes utilize the Temple Square sister missionaries as interpreters, but please only the hot ones. Now, I've never seen a Temple Square missionary that is not hot. There are oh. only women missionaries there. They are extraordinarily cute. And I know this because I took a group over there, including my husband, including my co-host, and I couldn't get the group to focus on anything. They were all talking to all the sister missionaries. So cute, so friendly, so fun. Yeah, it's definitely but by were design. wearing nuns habits? Yeah, no. <laughs> they weren't, that probably would have added to the intrigue. I'm not kidding. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do like how her, uh, what is that, a clutch that she's holding? Is that a book or a clutch? I like how it's matching her habit. Yes, I think yes. that's a nice look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but does she have man hands? Not that there's anything wrong with that. that no. Some people are into that. I mean, I don't. I I'm, have man hands. Don't be, don't, don't <laughs> hate on my man hands. Okay, it's fine. It's, I'm they, not, I'm they not need judging. need the man hands for all the waving that they do oh. to everybody on the, you know, it just tends to, yeah. Okay, I gotcha. <laughs> That's it. All right, how about uh, number, uh, about number eight here, uh, Lila? Ask members to boycott any events in which competitors are clearly not wearing garments. Oh, yeah, that, that no. gets rid of a lot. That does, especially in the skating. And what about those those volleyball players? I know this is Winter Olympics. Winter. Holy cow. 
Yeah, yeah. Winter Olympics. Winter Olympics here. And uh, Rebecca, I drew some helpful air, uh, helpful circles just in case you need to, <laughs> some, to highlight this. <laughs> Thank but you. It, I would not have noticed without that. You're absolutely right. And I would say males too. I mean, some of those, yeah. some of Oops. those outfits, you know, and and everything skin tight. You know, that's that's part of the appeal of the Olympics. They say <laughs> have everything altered to be garment ready. You know, oh, yeah. put sleeves and lower their yep. skirts down to their knees. That would be yep. cute. Yeah. yeah and like if, if, Idaho cheerleaders. Yeah. If they're not willing to do that, then uh, maybe we should, if, if all the members just boycott that, that will send they're the out. right message. That's going to send on a proper message mm -hmm. that uh, we don't tolerate these kind of outfits here in Salt Lake City. Or how about number nine, Rebecca? Who oh, it says, use the strengthening, strengthening the church members committee, the SCMC, to augment the FBI counterterrorism surveillance operations with the <laughs> meme that says, I'm watching you, always watching. And that's a good idea because not only do they have to keep an eye on the athletes, but also the members that are attending. There's a lot to do, a lot of ground to cover. So we definitely need to bring in reinforcements. Yeah, I think the FBI could learn a lot from the Strengthening Church Members Committee. You know, that's a that's a multi-million dollar operation. They got the wiretaps. They've got the uh, they got the people on the street. You know, people in the in the wards checking the Facebook. This is the perfect organization to link hand in hand to keep us very very safe in those Olympics. Absolutely. I feel like the people who are in the FBI and the CIA, most of them were previously in the SCMC. We know there are a lot of Latter-day Saints that join the, yeah, exactly. Okay, or Lila, how about number 10? Repeatedly quote that risable, is that what the word? Risable Isaiah passage, that all nations will flow to the Mormons in the mountains. Yeah, you remember Isaiah chapter two, moments. verse two. Yeah. At all moments, it will be fulfilling the prophecy. Yeah. It's exactly. already fulfilled the prophecy in 2002. But- we had to move the goalposts because people weren't ready for the second coming. Well, you can never fulfill a prophecy too many times. And that's a risible, by the way, is kind of a, it's a word that means ridiculous and obscure. Um, and this is the Isaiah chapter two, verse two. And it shall come to pass in the last days of the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Talk about a prophecy fulfilled. Yeah. Except we're not in the top. Oh, <laughs> Lila, you're semantics. Kind of... Okay, it doesn't. Okay, yeah, she's very precise, which is good. That's right. We've learned that. Well, that's why it's not going to be fulfilled then either. It's because oh. we haven't built it in the top yet. We oh, need to get to okay. The top. Okay, you know, gotcha. Caveat, right? Okay, I got you. And that does take us to if you're in the live chat, go ahead and cast your vote at this time. And Rebecca, will you be the first person to cast your vote? How can? What are the top ten things that the church needs to do to prepare for the 2034 Olympics? What is your selection? You know, as I always do, I'm going to go for Little Factory, number five. I think that's the most important thing out of all of them. Uh, well, you've got to send the right message. We could leave a Book of Mormon in the hotel rooms and a copy of Boyd K. Packer's Little Factory in those Olympic villages because there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in those li little Olympic villages. And Boyd K. Packer, he's going to send the right message to make sure that they are doing the right thing up there. You know what I mean? 100%. Sure. Uh, how about Lila? What do you think? What do you think the church should do to prepare for the Olympics? Well, I like that number eight because I'm so appalled whenever I see those girls out there. In the <laughs> oh, uh, I, yeah. So number eight is ask members yeah, to boycott. Children's eyes, you know, don't look at that. Yes, ask members to boycott any events in which competitors are clearly not wearing garments. And maybe this podcast is slightly sexist because I only had pictures of women up there. I should redo that. Have a couple of pictures of men up there. I do apologize for the oversight. For me, I just really think that it's uh, number two. Having been a member of the orchestra at Temple Square for a long period of time, um, nobody knows who the orchestra, mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, who the, the choir at Temple Square is. People know who the Mormon Tabernacle Choir is, and we need to go back to the way that things were so that people have a clue as to what's going on. So that's my yeah. humble opinion here. And that's that we're going to, before we round things out here, that does take us to our final uh, segment here, which is Lila, you got the Mormon joke of the week. Go. Did you hear about the Mormon drummer that married four women with the same name? No. Anna one, Anna two, Anna one, two, three, four. That's an oldie, but that's, <laughs> that's a good one. Okay. Uh, did you hear about the Mormon cat with a speech impediment? He yeah, had nine, nine wives. wives. <laughs> yeah, nine wives. They never get old. They never no, get old. Oh, they're so great. Hey, the, if pulling things out of hats is the Mormon tradition, so that's a perfectly acceptable joke. <laughs> that first joke is no problem. That's right. 
Ross. Yeah, Rebecca, what do you have coming up uh, in the uh, Mormonish podcast, the Good Book Club, the the Mormon Stories Good Good Book Club? What projects are you working on, and um, uh, what we can expect to see from you in the next week or two? Gosh, I feel like I kind of plugged my stuff as we went along, which in hindsight, that's not cool. I'm sorry I did that, but it was really relevant to what we were talking about. So on Monday, we're dropping an episode with the amazing uh, Margaret Toscano. This is on Mormonish Podcast to talk about, you know, the standoff, women coming off the stand and just Mormon feminism in general. That'll be really interesting. On Wednesday, we're dropping a podcast on the update of the Heber and Cody Temple situations. And then on Thursday, a podcast all about the truth of giving machines in the good book club next sunday is our meeting we are reading the happiness factor uh, or the happiness hypothesis by um oh my gosh now it's completely escaping me oh i can't remember you probably all know the happiness hypothesis and in the mormon stories book club we are reading uncultured so grab books log on to podcasts there's so much good content out there I think we all need to just quit our real jobs and watch and consume content, create content. Because I know you're um, getting rich on it. it oh, oh, we're so making so much money. Yes, that's exactly how it works. But we sure are having a lot of fun and meeting a lot of amazing people like everybody here. So that's my favorite part. Yes, we do have a Mormon News Roundup Patreon. If you care to make a donation, we'd be very grateful for that. Our next uh, episode of the Mormon Movie Reviews will be tomorrow night, and we're going to be reviewing that old classic, the 1974, The Lost Manuscript. And this is from the Mormon Movie Reviews. We release those every Monday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This has the famous scene in it where Joseph Smith with the beans in the wagon. You might remember that one. This is a really good movie. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Bandcamp, uh, to Weird Alma on Bandcamp.com for this episode's music. And uh, thank you so much for both of you for ruminating with me on the great and spacious beehive and remember remember no one hallowed this, hand will stop this program from progressing podcast from podcast. progressing one, just just one more time <laughs> no one please just, hand will stop this podcast from progressing so long i think you need to leave this in that was hilarious <laughs> When it comes to nicknames of the church, such as LDS Church, the Mormon Church, to remove the Lord's name from the Lord's Church is a major victory for Satan. 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 Satan.